Son, there's only two types of people on the field, winners and learners. Or at least that's what my dad told me. Internet, hello, my name is Pridium. This is Survivor's Hacking Challenges 8.0. And would you look at that, we've got no time to waste. The first hack on this list comes from season 17, Gabon. That's right, for all the train wrecky-ness of this season, it's got some decent challenge strategy. In episode five, there is a tribal immunity challenge where the players run a relay race going further into the jungle. There's three pairs of players and each subsequent pair will face a larger obstacle to retrieve some puzzle pieces. The players then return back to their mat, solve the puzzle, and there you go. Out of the gate, the Red Fong tribe falls behind, and so when Maddie and Kenny start the third and final part of the race, they have got some ground to make up. Not only that, but they're up against Marcus and Dan, who were two guys that were featured in the previous hack video, 7.0, from a unique strategy they pulled off in the previous episode. This matchup is a bit like David versus Goliath, except drop your expectations because Maddie and Kenny crush it here. The third obstacle is a big wooden mess of logs that the players have to climb through. We saw the previous pairs for the second part of the race climb under that one or step through it, but Maddie and Kenny take a different route. Simply put, they don't go under or through it, they go over. Like walking on air, they hop across the top and overtake Marcus and Dan, then retrieve the puzzle pieces faster and get back to their mat, having equalized their position in the challenge. All because of this one simple tactic. And then of course it wouldn't be Fong without Fong showing up. Their tribe blew the puzzle, way to go Fong, way to go. The second creative strategy comes from one of the most well-known Survivor superfans, and that is John Cochran on season 26, Karamoan, Fans versus Favorites 2. At the final four, there's a reward challenge called House of Cards, where players have to hold up a bunch of cards on one end of a balance beam while building a house of cards on the other end. They're given a whole bunch of cards to use and they have a lot of time to build upward. And the first player to build a tower high enough to reach the marker wins. Now, we have seen this specific version of this challenge three times in Survivor history, most well known in season 23, South Pacific, when Ozzy clutched it against all odds. We also saw it 11 seasons seasons later in Game Changers with Aubrey. This challenge proves itself to be a pain. Not only is it tricky to build a tower high enough without it falling over from poor placement or your breath, but also you have to move your body back and forth from one side of the beam to the other to grab a new card to place. The movement that you're forced to make causes the platform to wobble and really you have no one to blame but yourself. But one thing we see Cochran do that really gives him the edge and the win is when he places just enough of his cards in the middle beam so that he can build his entire structure without ever having to reach back and forth from one side to the other. He reduces the gap that his body has to move significantly and what's more, he eyes just how many pieces he needs to reach the top and then builds his tower with only one piece to spare. Mind you, he had several more pieces he could have used, but that would have wasted time and clearly they weren't necessary. We did see other players on this season attempt this maneuver too, particularly Sherry who tried to do what Cochran was doing. However, she did not bring as many pieces and was forced to move back to the other side of the beam, which caused her to lose the challenge. What's the best approach to build a solid foundation that can withstand a house of cards high enough to reach that red line? The higher it gets, the more precarious it gets. And that's how quickly it can tumble. Cochran with one slight move, and it happens to Sherry. Sherry's now starting over. It's gonna take a very light touch, which she might have, but no. Don loses her entire stack. Eddie loses half his stack. Sherry with another card. Cochran with another card. He is one card away. It would be his third individual challenge win. Cochran wins! Advantage! In episode five of season 32, Ko Rong, hack number three is so subtle that you might just miss it. Certainly, Anna and Peter did as they blew a lead at the puzzle portion of this challenge to Neil, 
who completely aced them where it mattered. In this challenge, the players retrieve puzzle pieces by doing some physical activity. It's not really important or the part of the challenge that mattered here. Let's just put it this way. They did stuff to get puzzle pieces that were shaped like fish, at which point they passed off the fish pieces to two of their puzzle making tribe mates. And this is the part that matters. We see Peter and Anna start the puzzle for the yellow tribe and not far behind them are Neil and Debbie on the blue tribe. Right away, Neil begins to assemble the pieces like he's done this puzzle in his sleep. And unlike other fast puzzle solvers, this was the first time Survivor had ever used this particular puzzle. So it's just all the more impressive what happens here. This puzzle has 14 pieces with two layers, seven pieces on top and seven on bottom. Right away, Neil cracked the code by noticing that four of the pieces had a unique extra feature to them. They had an extra fin on top. Neil deduced that these pieces were on each end, and from there he built the puzzle with those starting pieces in mind. When you flip to the yellow tribe, they have no idea what they're doing or looking at, but then you look at Neil and he's got the face of the most confident man in Cambodia, or at least on this beach. Neil aces the puzzle so fast because of this little maneuver, and before you know it, he's won the challenge. 14 puzzle pieces. Get them all on that table before you start working on the puzzle. Neil and Debbie have done a lot of work on puzzles. No. Chan Lo has a lot of pieces down. It can fool you. Neil and Debbie making a lot of progress if Good they're job, right. Yo. We got it, Jeff. We got it. Neil and Debbie think they have it. Immunity. Yeah. And they get up there. They had three pieces down, and it was done. Like. What? I also quickly want to mention that this same puzzle was used in Game Changers two seasons later, and uh, I looked at that version of this puzzle, and the players had to build the layers side by side instead of stacking them on top of each other. And when Jeff went to check to see if the tribes had completed the puzzle correctly on that season, I noticed that he slapped the four unique pieces to confirm they were correct. I think this was Jeff's way of knowing that the tribes had it right, which only confirmed to me how good Neil was in this puzzle two seasons prior. Also fun little fact is that Michelle was on Neil's tribe on season 32 when he solved this puzzle, and then she went on to solve the same one on season 40, so I wonder if she picked up any points from her first time out. The fourth creative strategy is for one of my favorite types of challenges that I just don't really talk about very often, and that is social challenges. Similar to a competition in one of my Big Brother Compact videos where an alliance rigged a competition by selecting the same answer to force a majority, this time around in Survivor, we are looking at one of the oldest challenges in the books. It's called Fallen Comrades, and it was only used five times ever. In the first four seasons, we saw it used at the end of the season. We actually saw V uh, big brain this challenge like crazy in the 2.0 video that I made way back when, when she used her journal to jot down information for this specific challenge? Well, after V did that, the producers never brought the challenge back until season 29, San Juan del Sur. In episode 11 at the final eight, this trivia challenge about previously voted out players returned one more time to see if it had any magic left in the tank. Turns out, it doesn't. At least, I don't think it does. And it's because of what the Fab Five Alliance of Natalie, Missy, Baylor, John, and Jacqueline accomplished that sees it entirely dead in the water, its skull crushed for all eternity. Like many challenges, this one's pretty simple. Jeff asked the players a trivia question about previously voted out players. The question is something random about who they are, their job, their family, what have you. If you get the question right, you can chop another player's rope. And after a player receives three chops, said player is eliminated. And mind you, this challenge is similar to the Q&A challenge we've seen a bunch of times as well, but because it's trivia about the players, it's more fallen comrades than it's those Q&A ones. After two rounds, the Fab Five Alliance have switched swiftly eliminated the three players on the bottom, Reed, Alec, and Keith. It was as straightforward and hassle-free of a challenge as you can get. Once those three are out, Natalie isn't sure who to hit next, so she turns and asks her alliance what to do. To whom do they want to give the challenge? Wait, hold on, Natalie, what? This challenge is intended to sow discord and chaos. It's supposed to reveal where your loyalties lie, what the pecking order looks like of your alliance. But what it's not supposed to do is bring you closer to them. Right away... Jeff hates this. Because the producers created these really cool skulls with fake blood that oozes out when they get crushed, and this is making a mockery of all that. And wouldn't you know it, that's the creative strategy here. It's a social strategy that you never see come up in Survivor 
ever. An alliance dominates a social challenge and then just decides who wins. All five of these players go around the producers and subvert their expectations and make for terrible TV in the process. And yes, if there is one thing Jeff Probst hates more than anything, it's terrible TV. He hates when the players get cute with production and outthink them. Which is why he then decides if the players aren't going to shake things up with this challenge designed to do just that, then he's going to do it instead. And in a weird way, what happens next after the challenge is over is akin to that same alliance that hacked this challenge, failing the challenge. Jeff talks, he probes, he makes some good points. The alliance begins to crack. Perhaps it's Jeff himself who is the biggest challenge of all. And with that... Oh. That's so Very gross. symbolic in blood versus Jack, water. Well, look. That Reed is I now know, right? covered in yeah, blood, his skull crushed. John doesn't hesitate. Alan, out of this game. I'll try. Keith already heading over. He knows it's coming. What are we gonna do? A lot of talking going over there, Alec, Reed, and Keith. Yeah, you guys oh. got two and yeah. and you are you gonna go to exit? Guys... Is this gonna be a friendly? We're just gonna see how this goes between the five of you for the rest of this challenge? Probably, Probably. so. Why are we wasting our time? The final creative strategy for 8.0 is digging deep, and I mean really, really deep. We are talking about season 33, Millennials versus Gen X. In the finale, when everything is on the line for Jay and he has got the lead in the immunity challenge, he's gotta win it, it's do or die, and then he forgets to cover up his lock combo and he gives the rest of the tribe a chance to sneak a peek at his answer, which shortens the lead he had. Damn it, Jay. You had one job, put the flap on. Here's the deal. This final creative strategy is something everyone should consider doing if they have the opportunity because it can make a noticeable difference in any given challenge. In this particular challenge, the players eventually encounter a lockbox with three numbers they need to input to pull a key out. Once they do so, they can then move on in the challenge. What needs to be known is that the producers usually provide each player with a flap that the players can put over their combination once they figure it out. Jay doesn't do this, and once he finds the answer first, he moves on, but David quickly, unabashedly, runs over and glances at Jay's combination to save himself the time of trying to figure it out himself. This is a similar strategy I've talked about in one of my Big Brother videos. Let the other players do your work for you, then take advantage of the time they used for you to get ahead. Or, in David's case, to catch up to Jay. Because once David does this, the rest the rest of the tribe then does it too, revealing that it's an allowed strategy that was preventable. The producers provided a flap for a reason. David eventually gets to the puzzle at the end and finishes it ahead of Jay, granting him immunity. We even see Adam try to copy David's puzzle to see if he could outpace David at the very end. But he did not cover it up! David takes advantage of it! Everybody is now looking! It is chaos! Big error by Jay! He's got a cover he could have used, and he didn't. David with another piece. Adam now looking at David's puzzle, trying to get some help. Jay, almost there. Oh. Jay loses everything. Jeff! David Jeff. thinks he has it. David wins! And while you're probably thinking, Pridium, that's really all you're gonna tell me, peaking, that's it? That's all you're gonna give me here? I went back over the past 10 or so seasons since Survivor planted itself in Fiji to see how often these combo locks appear and how often these anti-peaking flaps come with them. Did anyone else ever do this? And yes, I know this is a little bit much, just bear with me. From season 33 to season 40, this lockbox has appeared eight times in those eight seasons. Some seasons it hasn't appeared, other times it's appeared more than once, but yeah, of those eight times, six of them did not have a flap, but also six of them were done with tribes, not individual, so maybe that changes things. We did see Debbie and Game Changers rearrange her combination to avoid the other tribe copying her just as we saw Yule in Winners at War pull off the same maneuver. Season 38 is the only other time this lockbox was individual in Fiji, but the boxes had different combinations, so peaking really wouldn't matter. Amusingly, however, we did see a big commotion pop up in David vs. Goliath when Allison began feeding failed answers to Christian to help him save time. This turned into a frenzy very quickly. Orange did not 36. cover their combo. 18? Allison may have picked no, it off. 26 blank 27, 18. 27, 36, 18. 36, 18, hey, what did I tell you? I said we're gonna dig deep. I was curious about the combinations of these lockboxes. Was there ever a pattern to them? It turns out 
There is. I had noticed the producers constantly reuse the same number season after season. In fact, from the finale of season 33 to season 37, the same combination was used every season. 36, 27, 18. It was also used for one of the two lockboxes in season 38. And given that we know that the producers love to reuse challenges, it's only fitting that that's the case here too. And as I was digging all of this up, I came across a Twitter thread from a man named Ryan Barry. I wanted to give him a shout out because he went even deeper into all of this and organized all of the data into a handful of tweets. I thought it was really cool and applicable to future contestants. And what's more, somehow this player found a way to sneak into this video as if he weren't already in any more of my previous hack videos I found the one and only Adam Klein at the bottom of the Twitter thread explaining his strategy to tackle the lockbox that we see him do in the premiere episode of season 40, Winners at War. And while Adam does get a bit unlucky with his lockbox combo, there is still a bit of luck to this whole thing in the end. His blue Sele tribe manages to come from behind to win the challenge. I would like to think that he should at least get some credit for doing his homework. Yeah! And Jeremy does it! Sally has her second ring. You got this, Jeremy. Jeremy, for the win. Yeah! And he's got yeah! it. Sally wins yeah! immunity. Oh my gosh. Okay, can you all breathe? You guys can breathe down there. I think we're like deep in this hole that I've dug and I'm so sorry. I guess that's gonna be it for me. That is five more times Survivor players thought outside the box or the lockbox to get ahead. Let me know what y'all think. If there's any more creative strategies you may know that could deserve a shout out in a future vid. I will say, spoiler alert, there is going to be a 9.0 video and whew, I'm looking forward to it. A big thank you to my patrons on the screen for all your support, for enabling me to dig deep and then some. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to use every tool in your arsenal, least of all your shovel, on your way out. And I will see you in the next one once I come face to face with my fear of balance beams. He can't touch. No. Tiffany, we're so low. Let's go, Tiffany! No, Debbie's got to go back. In the hole, in the hole. In the lead, but they are dead last now as Debbie drops again. She has lost a lot of time. Nuka wins reward. Good job, baby. Mana comes up empty-handed. Yes, you've finished it. I'm sick of losing, guys. Me too. There you go, girl. There you yes, go. Yes! Yes! You did it.